Good morning. Welcome to PodCamp. Has everybody checked in on Twitter and Facebook and using the hashtag and all that good stuff? Yes. <laughs> I'm excited to say that. So we're all on Twitter and we will be monitoring, I'll be monitoring it during the panel presentation and um, we can see you. Last year I couldn't see anyone in this room. So if you have questions, feel free to raise your hand or jump up and down or do whatever you need to do. Um, my name is Sue Kerr and I'm the person who organized this session. You know some of the logistics here, or the exits in the back. If you need to get up and leave for any reason, that's totally fine. Some people may be coming in late, that's totally fine. We want you to feel free to ask questions at any point. You don't have to wait um, until a certain point in the presentation. And I, I think that's pretty much all the housekeeping. Oh, we are, of course, having um, a live cast of this, and then there'll be video later, just so you know everything you say will be, um, I was going to say held against you. <laughs> <laughs> no. It could be. Um, but today we're here to talk about self-promotion. And one of my former bosses used to always use the phrase, self-promotion is not a sin. And he would say that to me regularly until I started to realize that he was trying to actually tell me something about that. And, and I began to adopt that as a mantra. And I um, wanted to talk today about how we use social media tools to promote or self-promote when working with venues and performers. And I have two guests with me today and I will let them introduce themselves. But I do want to note you know, that this isn't just limited to our particular forms of art here, that it's, these are tools that could be used universally. So I'm going to start off with Andrea Varello. <laughs> Did I say it right, Varello? No, not even close. Really? Uh, <laughs> my name is uh, Andrea Alaquo Varello. Oh, God, I got it wrong. <laughs> uh, my stage name is Viva Velez. Um, I am a burlesque performer and producer. Um, been doing it for 10 years. This is my 10, 10 year burlesque anniversary. Um, I produce shows here in Pittsburgh. Uh, I produce uh, shows mostly at my, what I call my home venue, which is James Street Gastro Pub, but you'll hear more about that. And um, I have a master's degree in marketing and communication. So, and I don't really work in marketing and communications, but I use it a whole heck of a lot in my in my other life, in my burlesque life, not in my day job. So um, I, I definitely get a lot of practice with what I learned in school. So you do you do sometimes use your skills that you went to school for sometimes. I'm not going to try. Kevin Safner, did yeah. I get that right? You, you got that right <laughs> on the money. Uh, my name is Kevin Safner. I'm the uh, the owner uh, and booking agent of James Street Gastro Pub and Speakeasy. Uh, the co-founder of the Deutsche Town Music Festival on the north side, as well as some other smaller festivals and uh, events. Um, I, uh, my background, uh, my, my degree is in management, so had a little bit of marketing with that, but I've um, been booking and running events since uh, I was 14, so I've been doing, you know, from, I've seen this industry from hanging up flyers I printed out on a piece of paper at, at my mom's basement to how important social media is now. So it's uh, it's an intricate part of my life and it's probably the most, uh, what I spend the most time on in my, in my job. And I'm Sue Kerr. I am the founding editor of the blog Pittsburgh Lesbian Correspondence, which is an LGBT slash feminism slash politics slash cats blog. <laughs> um, it's the longest running LGBT blog in Pittsburgh and um, I am not a performer. Um, I never really thought of myself as an artist until I began working on the art of blogging with Most Wanted Fine Art out in Garfield. And that's what kind of led me down this path to working with more performers and venues around um, their artistic expression. Um, I'm a big fan of social media. I love Facebook. I like Twitter a lot and I'm pretty fond of Instagram. And <laughs> I do use Tumblr and I still use Google Plus <laughs> and all those other different, I know, I know. And um, I also work part-time, I guess you could say, or very casually with very, very small businesses who want, who have like six followers on Facebook and want to grow their Facebook page for their very small business. And it's been a really interesting um, journey. So we're not going to talk about SEO or ROI or any of those things today. That That is not what this panel is about. This is much more a 
how do you come up with a good hashtag type panel? And just using some real layman's kind of approach to this. Um, I've, so I'm on Twitter at PGHLesbian24. If you all want to follow me, that'd be awesome, and I'll follow you back. And I'm on Instagram and Facebook as PGHLesbian. Don't ask why I had to use the 24 on Twitter. It's a very long draw on that story. But do you want to give your um, social media handles for people that want to follow? Hmm. Um, mine is either Viva Velez, and that's um, V-I-V-A-V-A-L-E-Z-Z, -Z, um, or The Viva Velez. I think I'm on Instagram and Twitter as The Viva, the Viva Velez. <laughs> And James Street's pretty easy to find. Uh, we're just James Street on everything. Um, James Street 422. You're sure overwhelming. I'm not sure if that one's me or not, but uh, James Street 422 on Twitter. So we're pretty easy to find for everything. So I thought I'd start by just telling you how I got to know these two and why this, how that led to this panel. I live on the north side near James Street. And was a restaurant customer. Um, I'm not a really big fan of live music, to be honest, and never really went to any shows, but my partner did. And one night, we were there for an album release party, and I was just eating dinner and playing on Facebook and ignoring everything else. And Kevin was running a Twitter special or a Facebook special or something like that about whoever checked in won a prize. And I happened to be the first person that checked in, and I won. And he caught my attention by tweeting it out while I was at the venue instead of actually tapping me on the shoulder and telling me. And I was just really excited about that. And then suddenly I thought, huh, I should start paying more attention here. This, you know, this guy seems to know what he's doing. He's using social media. So I, I got to know him a little bit and we started, you know, pay, I just paid more attention because I was interested in how he was helping build the North Side up, which is my neighborhood. And then I met, the woman I used to know is Andrea. And <laughs> Dre, I met Dre because she was producing these shows on the north side that were for the queer LGBT community and I really wanted to support that so I uh, bought some tables for some of her events because I thought it was really exciting to have something on the north side that was for my community that was at a time that I could go because I, I don't go to things at 12 at night or 2 in the morning or anything like that so um, so really as I got to know them it grew out of an organic customer relationship and they engaged me on social media and I became more invested in their work and then as a blogger I started to write about them and so they became more invested in my work so it was kind of a symbiotic mm -hmm. type thing is that a, a fair summary yes. yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So, um, and I just say that because, you know, we're not here because we have anyone was hired to do anything. This is just, you know, we're working together to promote our own things and each other's things as well, bring each other along. So the first question I wanted to ask you is, when you began producing and hosting events, um, was social media as important as it is now? And if... So, or if not, what other kinds of tools did you use to promote events in that time period, whatever that might be, like say longer than five years ago? Right. Um, well, Kevin kind of touched on, I mean, back in the day when I first started to perform and produce stuff back in Columbus, Ohio, um, uh, of course, it was before social media because I'm old. Um, and, um, you know, we would use the flyers and not in your mom's basement, but, you know, we would print them out illegally at work or whatever. And uh, <laughs> so, you know, we were using regular advertising, you know, phone book, newspaper, all that, all the stuff we used to do. And then MySpace came along. And... Um, Boy, the hours I would spend on MySpace, like individually putting uh, promotions for my shows on on all of my friends' pages. <laughs> I mean, I spent hours like creating just the right image that would connect with that would connect with the audience, and then I would like paste it on each of their individual pages. It took hours, but I definitely started to grow uh, a fan base that way. And of course, now there's Facebook, and I'm definitely a Facebook whore. And um, I use it all the time, and I promote all of my shows with it. Um, and now, of course, you know, Instagram and Twitter. Uh, I don't use them as much, but definitely, I mean, I, I have all the various social media uh, 
en engaging with all various social media outlets that I can um, because each one of them has their own, own audience and uh, I want to cover as much ground as I can to get people to the shows. Yeah, and that's uh, one of the, for me at, at James Street, we're a pretty diverse place. Uh, we, I, I book and organize about 500 events a year um, from burlesque to drag to jazz to, uh, I mean, we had Charlie Tuna from Jurassic Five there about a couple months ago um, to Christian drinking clubs. Uh, we do a little bit of everything. So some things, for instance, the beer world for me, beer promo is Twitter. You put all your beer promo on Twitter. Music, everything comes through, through starts with Facebook. Food aspect, obviously everything's on Instagram. So being a restaurant slash venue, uh, really opens your eyes up to the differences between all the different platforms, but uh, still to this day, for for promotional purposes, Facebook is kind of the be all end all. It all starts there, and then you spread it out to everything else. What about back in the day? Uh, back in the day, uh, yeah, my mom's basement printing <laughs> stuff out and hanging them up at all the schools and giving them to my friends at every other school and have them hang up little pieces of paper that said the the day and the place and how much the party was and that's that's how you know that's how how it was until all the, all the social media came around um, and I mean now at this point I my my advertising budget is probably 80 80 to 90 percent is spent on social media I really don't do any more print advertising don't do any radio advertising anymore it's it, it's just not worth it I can spend a quarter of the amount on social media and reach the same amount of people now, people tend to think of social media as advanced promotion, ticket sales, raising awareness, that sort of thing. Um, why aren't we seeing more social media incorporated into the events itself? And I'll say, for example, PodCamp is very driven by all of these people here in this audience, these fine people, and in the other events, the other rooms, sharing as we're here live and then resharing. Hopefully everyone here is, is resharing on Twitter, into whatever channel they're on. But when you go to a more traditional type event, you don't see that. And I think it's even hard just to get performers in your shows to share the event in advance sometimes. So could social media be more than just advance work? Could it be more part of the performance itself? I, for me personally, I try to, for a show, to at least get one picture or video on Instagram. And if then sometimes I'll share it on Facebook and Twitter as well. I always try to get something on Instagram. A lot of the issue, though, is also being the production manager and ha you know ha watching a whole entire staff <laughs> to also be handling social media at 9 o'clock when you're really busy. Yeah. So it's almost you need somebody to specifically have that be their job, I guess. Or remind us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I'm lucky in that I have a troop of people, um, you know, and a group of people, uh, performers who are in my shows, and they are all uh, very social media driven. So, um, though it's maybe not directly incorporated into our show because we are obviously busy doing a million things, um, you know, performer, especially burlesque performers, like to look at themselves, right? So it's like, it's we're not ever short short on. Um, Facebook mentions or Instagram or like little videos with their butts or like, you know, <laughs> just like there's always, there's always the social media everywhere at a burlesque show. It's just a, it's just a given. So, um, the task though is getting them to promote the show or to promote, um, you know, if we have a hashtag for a show or something is it's, uh, it's sometimes we're too busy to remind them to use that, but they're, they're definitely all on social media the whole time we're at a show, so. Yeah, I'll see that someone will say, I'll be performing XYZ, and then might name the venue at James Street, but then the link they put is to their own website, <laughs> not to the ticket link or, yeah. you know, that seems to be difficult. Yeah. And I don't think it's even really an attempt to be a jack off, it's just no. kind of they don't think <laughs> about it. Well, because they're, they're very self-absorbed. <laughs> and that's okay, yeah. uh, self-promotion. Self-promotion is not a sin. So, Kevin, do you have anything to add to that about 
getting performers to uh, participate in this? Yeah, that is the, the most difficult part of my job. Um, like I said, I book, book about 500 shows, events a year, work with thousands and thousands of artists. Um, nationally touring artists is pretty easy because they have a management group behind them, but local musicians and bands, um, it's it's there's a direct correlation. People that promote their shows hard, they have more people come out. It seems common sense, but still a lot of people, for some reason, feel that if you're a performer, you don't need to promote. That's not your job. Your job is to perform. It's it's not that simple anymore. Everybody's promoting. So if you aren't, you're the one that's missing out and you're the one that will lack behind. And I have some great bands that work for me, great musicians that don't promote. And I have some not very good bands that promote really hard. And it's sad to say that I have to take the less talented bands because they get more people out and they try harder and it's it's you know it, we're all in business here we've got people that need to eat so if you're not giving it a hundred percent it it does get noticed especially i mean at least in my industry i can't speak on on others but for for me it's 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 vital to to everybody's success so that's something that um i've messed up on over the years and in hindsight something i'm going to move moving forward i'm going to i it's being a mainly local venue we've kind of done everything on a handshake. Um, you know, I know most of these people and you say, hey, here's the date, here's the deal, cool. And that's normally it. But moving forward, I'm gonna start working with contracts and saying, look, every single musician is required to invite 100 people to the Facebook event. You're required to share this on your personal page and band page, Instagram and Twitter, at least once or twice. You know, it, it's, got, it's gotta be both ways. You know, we've gotta work together on this. Um, being a venue manager and a promoter, I do that the best I can, but I'm only allowed to invite 50 people on Facebook now because Facebook knows this is what I do, so I, I, I can only do so much at this point. So it's 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 difficult task, but the people that get it are the people that are succeeding, and uh, you know they're starting to leave the city and go play shows elsewhere. It's 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 worthwhile. Yeah, we um, like I said, I run a troupe of probably uh, 20. 20 performers and it's going to sound crazy but like um because we're not really it's not really our job like <laughs> um but yeah the effort definitely pays um it's in our it's in my contract that i have with all of my performers i i don't know if I've, i don't think i've ever told you this um that they are um expected to promote so they sign a contract every year that says i um, promise that i'm going to share all of all of these events on Facebook or, you know, whatever social media outlet they use. So, you know, even, even businesses that don't, <laughs> that are hobbies, um, you know, we want to get asses in seats. We want people to come out to the shows and, you know, we could have one person do all of the promoting, but obviously um, one person doesn't have as much reach as all of us have as a team. And, um, you know, not all of us, have the same friends Not all of us have the same fan base so it's real important um, for all of us to do our part and promote uh, on social media now Dre you did something we were talking about outside of pretty innovative with your international festival in terms of how using selfies to identify future headliners mm -hmm. and could you please explain that specifically sure. to the um, so I also produce a festival every year. It's the only queer burlesque festival in the world. And um, I was tired, I'm, I was tired, I'm tired of seeing just the same old superstar burlesque performers get all in it. This is, I, you're gonna think all these things sound crazy because you're not in my world. But um, you know, there, I see the same perform, really great performers headline uh, at burlesque festivals, and there are many of them across the country. And so I was tired of seeing the same old people get all of the attention. And I know that burlesque performers love to take selfies. And so um, probably my second year, this we're going to our sixth festival, um, my second year I came up with the idea that if people are gonna take selfies anyway, I wanted to encourage it. And at the end of the festival weekend, the performer who has the most engaging, most, um, I guess engaging is the best word, the most engaging set of selfies that kind of told the story of their weekend would then get to be a headliner for the following year. 
So the, so the choice isn't based on how talented you are, how pretty you are, how popular you are. It's on whether or not you can effectively use social media to promote my festival. So, um, you know, now I have every year, you know, people do compete, you know, they get really innovative with the kind of selfies that they take and they kind of, um, and then in turn, I get to use all of those selfies because um, that's part of the, uh, part of the, part of um, submitting to, to be um, considered for the, pri the prize is that I get to use all of your selfies for the following year um, to, you know, promote the festival too. So, um, it, it's worked out really well. I mean, I have more people who um, engage in the competition every year. Um, you know, do we always, I mean, that person isn't necessarily the best performer in the world, but I don't care. You know, it's somebody who obviously put effort into it and really enjoys my festival and really enjoyed their time in whatever city the festival was in. So, I don't know. It was just a, a fun way to get them to use social media and to get them to promote my festival. And do you see that as the year goes on, that person is more invested in promoting the festival because they're going to be headlining? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I mean, they definitely promote the festival. Um, it's hard to measure. It's more. hard to yeah. It's hard to measure because I don't really follow all of them. So, I mean, I don't have time to look at all their selfies all year long because there are <laughs> hundreds of them. <laughs> um, but yeah, isn't that all we do all day? Sit around looking at them. <laughs> So, and, you know, I wanted to just segue into something that didn't work out as well. That was my idea that involved <laughs> both of you. And we um, tried something a couple weeks ago. Uh, Dre had a show at James Street, and I wanted to see how we could incorporate getting more people to check in to the venue and to like the pages. So the first thing we did was... I wrote up some cue cards for the hosts to use, and we were gonna focus on liking those two pages and checking in. And then I got the bright idea, not so much, of adding um, an incentive, that we would give away a prize and we'd draw a name. But the problem is that I wasn't an administrator on the pages, and uh, Kevin was doing something somewhere, not even at that particular show at that point in time, and um, Viva was performing <laughs> the show. So we had an issue where I couldn't see who had liked anything. And we hadn't really thought about that ahead of time. I didn't think about it. It was my, my bad. <laughs> now, we, we saved the day because Dre's partner, Ange, was there and let me use her phone. And we, we looked for the person. And we drew a winner who wasn't even there. So that kind of worked out. But um, what we noticed, <laughs> what I noticed the next day, because I did compare the numbers, is that Asking people to like the two pages, both pages gained about 10 followers that night. Rough, I think maybe 10, yeah. 11, roughly. Yeah, it was 10, yep. And the Velvet Hearts page had about 590 followers or so to begin with, and James Street had a close to 8,000, I think. And But I still know, I just looked at the numbers and, and was able to see that. And um, so they did that not because of the incentive, but because of they were asked to, to mm -hmm. like the page. It was a simple gesture. And so w what are your thoughts on something so simple as actually asking people in a venue to like a page? Yeah, I mean, I think um, uh, <laughs> I think it's real simple. I mean, I think just simply asking them or reminding them uh, you know, that, that we have these social media outlets and to, act, to actually ask them to follow you, um, they will. You know, some of them, not everyone, but, you know, some of them actually will. So, um, top of mind awareness also is uh, important, you know. So, you know, having the MC mention that we have a website or Facebook pages or, you know, whatever social media we want to um, hype up that for that particular show. You know, having it in the notes, having the MC actually mention those things um, does make a difference. Because... The world is so, or, you know, especially at our shows, people are very social media driven, so. Is, uh, is anybody in here, like, is it, like uh, I guess, is your career going to be in social media or marketing, or does anybody in here, like, own or manage a business or anything like that? So, like, if you, if your field is in any way going to be involved with this and 
you're going to make money and you're going to need social media to make money, one of the first things I would say is invite every single friend that you have on Facebook to that page. Then get all your friends and family to sit down and do the same exact thing. And everybody you employ, get them to do the same exact thing. Because when I, like, whenever I, two years ago, I came back to James Street and we had like 200 likes on Facebook and like right now we have almost 9,000. Um, and all, all I did was just ask my friends to help me out and my coworkers and say, hey, look, like the more people we have on here, the more money you can make working here because the more people I can reach. Simple as that. This is going to take you 10 minutes to invite people to this page and it costs you zero dollars, but it can make you tons of money. And once you put it in simple terms like that, people normally respond and say, oh, okay, I, I see the point in, in, in doing this and taking the 10 minutes of my day. Um, so if anybody is, you know, if this is going to be your field, that would be, it's the simplest and cheapest thing in the whole entire world. And it makes a huge difference. So just, just ask a favor of anybody and, and most people will do it. Mm -hmm. yeah, I noticed that night we had a lot of fun with it. The other host, Devon, was really playing along with it and making all kinds of jokes and, and then actually offered to um, buy a shot for someone. And I mean, just really got into the whole idea of getting people to like, they wanted to get more likes than you got. <laughs> so it was, and it was, it became part of the show itself. Now I could now a show like yours, you have hosts, you have people doing talking in between performances. But Kevin, you know, when someone's doing a mus a strip music show, like a jazz show or whatever would you know, is there still an opportunity to work that into I I guess I'd call it like the patter or something where to to remind people to like something on Facebook or Yeah, I mean there there always there always is um it sort of depends on your crowd though. Like our jazz shows are a little bit of an older clientele, so that might not be the most beneficial event to, to do something like that with. It, it just, it depends on the crowd, you know. Obviously the burlesque, everybody's very social media savvy. Whenever you have a young punk band there, everybody there is pretty social media savvy. Our drag brunch, we get tons and tons of people taking pictures and sharing everything and being very involved. So it just totally depends on what the the show or the event is, I would say. Um, I also, at the last show, because I knew we were going to try to really pay attention to our social media reach, um, I also like printed out cards that had all of our various um, social media outlets written on a card so that that may, if you didn't want to do it at the show, you could just take it with you if you really wanted to follow us or, you know, catch up with, you know, whatever the next show was or news about us or, um, so that might have helped too in terms of. Well, and that also helps because people don't always hear the letters the right way or, yeah. you yeah. know, it's not, not it's, um, so giving people a visual reminder of what the actual count is. And especially when you get on Facebook, you can sometimes get some very convoluted URLs and it's hard to, to find them. So I, I think that's a good point is having printed version as well as a written version. You know, something we did in that conversation with the crowd that night though is talk about the fact that checking into the venue on Facebook, for example, was a way to thank the venue for having the kind of event that you liked. And it what liking the page was important, but checking in was also a way to say, I'm here, this is important to me, this matters. And that I think we talked about it being like tipping the wait staff. When you tip the bar staff, you tip the wait staff, but you're not tipping the owners, but you tip them by liking their business and then encouraging them to do more shows of a similar nature. Is is that a fair assessment? Do you think? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, like I said earlier, it's all about getting people to see what you're what you're putting out there. And uh, whenever somebody shares an event or checks in, it's you know it's. It, it helps so that it's you know it's kind, it's kind of like my favorite pat on the back honestly because most of the time in, in the service industry you hear about all of the problems <laughs> when somebody's burger is not done medium well enough or something along those lines so whatever somebody checks in and shares a picture or something you know you're like you're I'm, I'm always really thankful for that and uh if you do support a business or a team or a musician or anything like it's a simple way to actually help them out if you truly support what they're doing so 
you know, any of your friends' businesses and things like that. And these two are great with it. You see them sharing, you know, each other's events and different things. And, and that's how you build up a community. Because for, for me, if the more people that come to Viva's shows, the more people know about James Street. And if they're sharing Viva's shows, they're sharing James Street with that. And then the next night, we might have some touring band come through and they might have not been to Viva's show, but they heard about it from somebody at her show. And then they'll say, oh, you know what? I heard that place has a bunch of different things going on. And then the next night they might show up. And that's sort of how it snowballs. Social media can really help snowball faster than any other format, really, because it can get rolling like that. And sort of in a, you know, in a viral sense, as, as a lot of things are nowadays. So that, that's where it really makes a difference. So, you know, one of the things that I've come up with in the last year or so is this concept of a social media sponsorship. And some events will offer that as like a package for their actual sponsors, like the gold level or the met, you know, the silver level. And the social media level means that if you support the ballets, whatever event, they're going to promote you on their social media. But I'm flipping that and I'm looking at social media sponsorships along the lines of traditional media, like city paper. They always hate when I call them traditional media, but so it's kind yeah. of fun. Hey, Charlie. Um, um, WESA, W. I can't think of the other one. WIP. WIP. You know, the, the, oh, God. Um, that when you work with them to promote your event, they will typically give you uh, about a 50% discount on your on your advertising budget, and you can use their logo. They'll promote you. They'll add you into other kinds of things. It's, it's a kind of a good deal. Um, and I see that with my blog as an opportunity as well, That because I can write a blog post and get it out to a lot of people. I can also use my following to promote your event. It's only, it's, I don't have the following of the city paper or the YEP, but for a blog, I think I have a pretty good following in Pittsburgh. So that's actually something I've been trying to work with where I'm serving as a social media sponsor. And it's been a really interesting process. Right now I'm working with the um, LGBTQ film festival, Real Q, which will be starting on the 13th of October and running for a week downtown at the Harris Theater. See how I work that in? That's part of my social media sponsorship. <laughs> but, but, but I'm, so I, you know, I write a couple blog posts and then I do a certain amount of touts and then um, in return, you know, I get some advertising for my projects and, and it, it's, it's a nice reciprocal relationship. But I think it has a lot of potential because then you have somebody that's doing a plan. And that's kind of what you both have been mentioning is that it seems like part of the issue is that it's both of you planning everything and you have eight million other things that you have to think of at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I know that not everybody can just hire a social media sponsor, so I'm not suggesting that in the in the as a, as a solution. But sometimes it can be good to designate someone, or to sit down and do a plan ahead of time about how you're going to do things. Because I just handed your hosts the note cards, and they're like, "Okay," and put it into their. They didn't question me. They didn't argue with me. <laughs> you know, there was no issues. Um, I also took the responsibility of mo monitoring the accounts before and after so that that didn't have to happen. And, you know, it doesn't, I, uh, social media sponsors, I mean, I w I'm not going to lie and pretend I didn't organize this panel because I wanted to promote that as a concept, but I also think it doesn't have to be a formal relationship. It can just be a designated person. They're not responsible for all your social media, but at the event they handle those tasks. Just like you have someone that's in charge of equipment and someone that's in charge of making sure the performers get online and the music and all of that kind of stuff. That you can bring that into your planning process and sit down ahead of time and maybe put half an hour into it. And then at the last minute you're not like, oh my God, what's our hashtag? Or yeah. we don't have everybody's Twitter handle. Someone's asking a question. I mean, I, I sponsor a lot of things on uh, Facebook, um, a little bit on Instagram. I, I haven't, I mean, it might have gone up a little bit, but it's, it also depends on um, if you're doing like just sharing an event or a picture, how many words are on it. So there's there's all sorts of ways back and forth, but it's it's pennies on a dollar. It's, it's 
So, so for a, so for a really big event for me that I'm going to put the maximum into promoting, it would literally be maybe thirty dollars. And for thirty dollars, I probably can reach if it's a well written thing and a good graphic, you can reach twenty thousand people probably. Or you can set a budget. Like yeah. you can say, I only want to spend twenty dollars, and then they'll reach as many people as. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what they're calcul you know, how they calculate it, but they reach as many people as as they can for your but whatever your budget is. So if you only want to spend five bucks, even you could just spend five dollars, and that they'll put. It Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I haven't put I haven't paid money to a newspaper in two years or or any other avenue. <laughs> I found that um I think the price has probably increased a teeny bit because Facebook is a business and they're trying to make money. Um I've been I mean, I do really modest ads for some of my clients, like, you know, trying to build their likes, promote their, promoting events on Facebook f can be difficult price-wise. Like, I find that I do better when I'm promoting a post. So when I put a blog post up on my page and promote that on using Facebook ads, I get a much higher resp response rate than when I promote an event. It, but the price isn't different. It's the return on the investment. Oh, I said I wasn't going to say that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, for example, because no, 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 no it's not. It's fine. It's. I think you should, um, you know, Google find some good reputable sources, read some different perspectives on that. Facebook advertising. The benefit is that you have a lot of control over it, and because you can spend a dollar or two or five, you can really play around with it. I write a lot of blog posts that are very specific to LGBTQ people in Western Pennsylvania for one particular project that I administer. So sometimes I will have a blog post that just as an example is written by someone who is identifies as transgender and they live in a rural community. So I will specifically target the trans community in rural Western Pennsylvania and I will spend five dollars and I will get tremendous response because it's very, very, very targeted. But that's just bringing visitors to my website. That's not translating into revenue right now for me. And, but I do believe in it. I've, I've, my Twitter account was recently verified. Everybody cheer. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Apparently it's a big deal. I didn't know this, but I, you know. So I have a, tw I have a verified Twitter account. So they occasionally ask me if I want to, you know, have pay for promoted special special tweets and and I've heard that Twitter advertising is a little more pricey so I haven't really yeah. delved into that but I have a I have a more followers on Twitter than I do on Facebook so it's kind of a a backwards thing you know I think what you have to do is sit and do your research and you, you need to have a plan um, most of the people that I work with tend to just throw money at Facebook they're like oh I'll just boost this post and that's it. And they don't use the advertising tools. They don't think about it. And I'm like, for the $40, $50 you've thrown away in the last couple of months, you could have really built up your base. Of, I mean, they don't have 300 followers on their page. Like, so I'm not sure who they're advertising to. And, and yeah. so I, I think it's a good thing, but I think that it's important just to really think it through. What are you trying to accomplish and who do you want to reach? There are a lot of websites in Pittsburgh where you can list your events. And I think it's important to do that, but it takes hours. And again, that's a kind of a job that you can have, whether paid or unpaid, for an event, that somebody's responsible for doing all that. I still look at the city paper online event listings all the time, especially when it's like, what are we gonna do this weekend? I look on Facebook to see what events are coming, but Facebook just changed the way they list events, and it's not as easy to navigate. I go to the city paper website and I scroll through everything. So, hi Charlie again. Um, that's, you know, I think those sites matter and I know that there are a lot of other sites out there that do that. So, I don't want to suggest that people give up the old way of doing things. I, I don't think that that's important, but how you, how you add social media, it just doesn't work magically. I think some people tend to think about that. If I put it on Facebook, everybody will come to my event, and that's not true at all. It's gentleman in the blue. Are you in blue? Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yes. 
So, are you doing it from a page, or your own? From a, from the business page, or your personal first. account. So, okay. from a business page, you're not reaching everybody unless you're paying. First of all, and even if you're paying, you're still not reaching everybody. Okay. I mean, do people have to like the page, or do they add you as a friend on in Facebook? Okay, so then yes, yeah, so then it's a business page then. So you're not reaching, so even if you share that, you're not reaching everybody on, on your page at all. Facebook, you have to pay to reach everybody. So more or less, I don't think you're going to annoy anybody. <laughs> it's not going to keep showing up in the same person's feed over and over again. Unless they're... I, I, that's one of the things like kind of bring it back to the bands, inviting people to shows. Everybody always says the same thing to me, that it annoys people. And I said, well, if, if your music's good, you're not annoying people. If your product is good and you're truly behind it, you shouldn't be annoying people. They should be excited to see it if, you know, so you should never feel bad about self-promotion um, if you truly believe in what you're doing. I also think we're so inundated with so many things now. People always say to me, I don't want to invite people. I, uh, they're going to so many other shows, this is going to annoy them. Well, no, like if you don't, if you don't tell people about it, if you, you almost have to force things down people's throats nowadays because there's so much information out there. There's so many things going on. I post uh, numerous times a day. And now, granted, it's a wide variety of things from pictures of food to drink specials to the shows. So it's, it's pretty, it's, makes it, it's a little more diverse. But I don't see anything wrong with putting things out there a few times every single day. Um, if people don't want to see it, they don't like, they can not like the page anymore. But that rare, rarely happens. And, and you have to think about, you know, the, the general marketing role with Facebook. Um, three to one, four to one, whatever metric you use that you should give people something that they're interested in and then make the ask and so you should be creating content that is not a direct promotion of your event like not that blatant ask but that could be something like profiling one of the artists or a link to an article about you in a paper or you know something that's and and um I do. I I just use three to one for simplicity's sake. But I put a, I share a lot of content on my um, blog site, Facebook page, um, that's related to LGBT content, but it has nothing to do with me. It's just I'm sharing from other sites, and then I put my own content up on a regular basis as well. But it's kind of intermingled, so that people feel like I'm building a, that they can view me as a credible authority on LGBTQ content that's also reflected in my own content that I create. If it's just your stuff on your page, people will tune it out because it feels like an ad. But if you're adding really interesting things that pe your, your fans will be interested in but doesn't directly tie into you personally, um, that's a nice way to offset that. I think that works. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. That's yep. Yeah. As long as you're doing that, that makes total sense. In the back, right there, man. I'm going to be doing a May the 4th prom, uh, <laughs> so I need to talk to you. <laughs> I've, I've, it's going to be awesome. <laughs> I found that too, that um, because I, I have blog posts for my Amplify project every twice a week usually, I share it all over Facebook those days. But I've talked with the group managers 
And the group managers that say to me too much, they tell me. They're blunt, and I know that. So what helps me is I use scheduling software so I don't have to break the rules. and I Because I don't want to break the rules. I want people to read the stuff. But what I am able to convince some people is, is that what I'm sharing is not something that Sue wrote. I, I produced it on my page, but it's actually the voice of an anonymous bisexual kid in Westmoreland County who otherwise wouldn't be heard. And then people start to say, oh yeah, we definitely want you to share this a lot. It's not the same thing as your own blog post. So sometimes just having conversations. Now I go onto Reddit every once in a while and boy, that's a nightmare. But it's, um, I've learned that like the Pittsburgh page, I never share anything. Because <laughs> they will yell at me for posting stuff to my blog. But on all the LGBTQ sites on Reddit, all the subreddits, they're fine with my posting original content. So a lot of it is just doing your due diligence to find out what are the rules and what are the comments. And I think this woman back here had her hand up. Like, I personally try not, I keep my shows to a very, very minimum because I book so many. That that would be annoying if I shared every single show on my personal page. So I very, very rarely do that. Um, I mainly only share charity events from my personal page. So I found that to be something that people will get behind and support and, and not be annoyed. So for me, that that's kind of how I do it. Um, I try to keep my personal page is, you know, more much more personal stuff. Well, the audience, I mean, your audience is different, right? I mean, your, your personal page has like your actual friends and it has, you know, maybe other perform, you know, similar people who do similar type of art. Um, so, but your business page is just random people you don't know who you, you know, who you obviously want to promote to. So I'm one of those annoying people that does post everything, both on my personal page and my business pages. Um, but you're not doing 500 shows a year. Yeah. Right. So it's that's, not that annoying. But it seems like it sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> I have um, just reached the point with my private timeline where I'm about to hit that 5,000 mark. And so about a year ago, I started a, Sue Kerr blogger page, and I have an amazing, I think, 250 followers there. So I started trying to share things on that page to make that transition, because at some point I'm not going to be able to have more friends. And, But I do tend to share, a, because I use the scheduling software, it's a lot easier for me. I use Buffer app, and it does, I just get, usually, I think everybody loves everything that I love, so I put it on everything, on my blog page, my personal page, my timeline. But I am... Um, I don't know. I guess I'm just more blasé about it, I suppose. But I do think it should be deliberate. It should be intentional and you have to be thoughtful. I'm pretty out loud as, a, as an openly lesbian blogger. I talk about everything. I try not to be, you know, so I don't feel like on my page I have to hide certain things. Like I don't wor worry about what my aunt thinks, you know, that kind of thing. Other people don't have that luxury. So that's... You know, and, and to be honest, with 4,500 friends, like if someone unfriends me, I don't even really notice. And that sounds terrible until suddenly I try to send them something and I'm just like, uh-oh, what happened there? And I have to check on that. So I I guess really it depends is the best way to yeah. to put it. I do like the charity thing, though, Kevin. I think that's a good yeah. That's a good, a good compromise. So did someone else have a question? I'm sorry, could we go to him because he didn't get a chance yet? Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Yes. So how, how does that work? Well, oftentimes you can consider it barter. So I'll just use a film festival as an example. So I have a value on the package of what I'm offering them for the blog posts, the social media touts, whatever I will do. And then I get equal value. So in this case, I get two passes to the festival. I get an ad in their program. They listed me on their website. So we just worked it out to be, and I'm doing that for them because they're in my community and I want to support them. And their their base is someone that um, 
people that will be responsive to what I have to do. So I, I, I have set it up so it's really there are values like you know I could do I could be a social media sponsor for cash too so I can work for a, f a $500 package a thousand dollar package um, it really just depends on the event and you know and I try to be really flexible in terms of what you know um, so like I do actually Kevin and I do this with the drag brunches yeah. so I write a blog post drag brunches twice a month so I write a blog post each this Sunday at noon Sunday noon. I write a blog post. I mention who the performers are. I have a graphic, and then I share it. At, oh gosh! And then I knock the mic over. <laughs> um, I share it all over the place, and then in return for my promotion of the drag brunch, I get to come for free with a, with a guest, and then I also get a brunch. So both Kevin, as the venue, and the performer who is in charge of the admission tickets they both benefit from my exposure and then i get brunch twice a month <laughs> in a nice drag performance and then you know it's a real nice straightforward exchange and it seems to be going well and and um so does that answer the question carefully you know yeah okay do you have an event coming up please see me afterwards and we can <laughs> we can negotiate <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a question back up here? Yeah. Oh boy, that's a classical. Uh, yeah, I mean. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, just recently, I hired an admin for <laughs> for my work and uh, for the work of the troupe, um, and it's her job to maintain the calendar. And that was a that was actually a point of discussion just yesterday. I think like when you have twenty performers in your troupe and they're all doing various shows, and you want to, um, you know, you want to keep your brand rolling. Obviously, you want to announce that those you know, that your performers are in all these various shows but it, it making it their responsibility to like you said add their events to the calendar is is like pulling teeth like <laughs> I, I don't want to leave that to one person to do all the time because it would be impossible because there's just so much no I mean and plus we keep our calendar public just yeah, just to simplify things, and it's still they, we still can't get them to fill in their own stuff. It's frustrating. <laughs> Did you have a question up front there? Uh, I, I was just reminded the San Francisco Opera advertises by having a bunch of volunteers come and volunteer to tweet during the dress rehearsal. Yes, so that's cool. Three hours of yeah, nice. There's there's a bricolage theater here in the cultural district has the tweet seats. And um, they will bring a bunch of us in who are, and they rotate, which is great, and you get a free admission and a plus one. And we sit in the back because we're allowed to tweet and have our phones on during the show. And that's a really interesting, um, we didn't really talk about this too much, yeah, but there can be a real idea. constraint sometimes because you have to follow union contracts. You have to follow, um, musical recording contracts when you're, you know, performance, if you want to live stream as an individual versus as an organization, a lot of theaters won't let you use Twitter or Facebook because it's actually written in the contract of their union performers, both the stagehands and the actors, that you won't do that for lots, for lots and lots of reasons, liability and all that. So doing it during a dress rehearsal makes sense. And um, it's a smart way to get around that and of course get people interested and coming, and I wish more cultural events in Pittsburgh incorporated social media more aggressively. Um, I want to say too, just right now, the City Theater does a really great job of they include bloggers as traditional media, but you can't do anything during the event itself. But dress rehearsal is a great idea. Mm -hmm. So, what was that? San Francisco Opera? Is that what you said? San Francisco Opera. San Francisco Opera. Awesome. Everybody like them on Twitter. Uh, yeah. Yeah, SF, Opera. <laughs> SF Opera. Let's see that go up. Any other questions? 
suggestions, <laughs> ideas. We're running over, but this is I'm so excited we had all these questions. Great. This is this is great. Feel free to reach out to any of us. We'll be happy to talk with you, and um, you can find us on Twitter or Facebook. Probably yep. more on Facebook, but Instagram. Um, or come to James Street and order a beer and yep. some good food and hang out. Um, Watch a burlesque show. Yes. Yeah. We have some <laughs> events coming up. We're going to be doing a um, guest bartender event at James Street on October 24th. And Viva, as Viva, will be doing one of our guest bartenders. <laughs> as Viva. And yeah. Penny. She's in charge of keeping all of the other queens in line who are performing. We've got like six drag queens coming, so it's it, someone's going to be on top of the bar's t- table at some point, I yeah. think. And then we have um, a performance on the 22nd, Twinkle. Mm-hmm. That's a um, uh, kid's drag show. So <laughs> little kids doing drag, or it's basically a variety show. Like not all kids are courageous enough to do drag, but a couple do. And um, so it's just a kid's variety show and dance show. So, you know, kids little boys who like to wear dresses and little girls who don't like to wear dresses <laughs> can just be themselves and it's just a cute little kids party but it's very entertaining you know and it's during a br- it's during brunch so you can eat brunch and, and it's watch, a fundraiser. watch a kids show and it's a and it's a fundraiser for the Pittsburgh Equality Center youth program and i would like to tell you that Viva's child <laughs> E the Dragnificent a tw- is a 12-year-old gender-fluid child who is a drag performer and has developed this drag identity. And they are headlining at the Austin Drag International Show in Austin. November in, in November. Austin. And I just wrote their very first interview on my blog that they've ever done in their whole life all by themselves. So read that at PGH Lesbian. And, you know, and we're going to bring home the championship. There's no championship to bring home. But I still feel (laughs) like we should talk about it that way because we love our titles in Pittsburgh. We love our prizes. And for a 12-year-old to be headlining an international festival with some really, really top-notch performers is pretty darn impressive. So, um, and they are just the sweetest kid ever in the whole world. So, and that came out of all our... I would not have written that article. It's now in Huffington Post and all that kind of stuff. So it just shows you the symbiotic relationships that can grow up. It's not just about a Facebook share. Right. It can lead to a lot more. Any f- parting thoughts? Kevin's like, time. Yeah. It's time to <laughs> leave. You can tell. You can see the <laughs> management. Yeah, just- I, gotta ba- I gotta get back to work. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for joining us today. And we hope. Um, to see you on Twitter and Facebook and all that goes places and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank, Thank you guys. You.